Hello, everyone. Welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Today, we're going to have a very tough conversation. I know that on my podcast, we have those quite often. But I have to say for parents, this is dedicated for parents. Of, of course, for those who know someone who is struggling suicide too. But I found my guest by listening to her experience and reading a little bit of what's on, on her website. She heard from her three teenage daughters the hardest sentence you can hear from a child. I want to die, mom. All three of them had depression. One of them attempted suicide more than once. One of them had panic attacks who were debilitating. And she's here with us to share, to share her experience. And today, you know, after all of this, hopefully we're going to learn a lot from her. I know we will because she has the experience. She is also a counselor. She has a lot of experience. She has a BA in psychology, but it's one of those things. You can be a psychologist. That doesn't mean that you know everything. And especially when it comes to your kids, we are human beings, right? We we get scared with a few things in our lives because we think we know everything. And then next thing you know, you didn't see the signs. And I know that that's something that crossed her mind. We've talked very briefly by email about this because I want to, to have a very spontaneous conversation with her. But today it's her mission. Her name is Dawn Day. She's talking from Colorado, United States. And... I'm just very, very glad I found you, Dawn, because I know that you'll be so helpful to those parents who are struggling with kids who have suicidal ideation. And that's what we're going to focus on today, on your experience with your kids. And I'm so glad they're doing well, all three of them, mm -hmm. in a very good path to healing, as you said. Thank you so much for being with us. Welcome to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to reach out to other parents and uh, educate people out there about what this experience is like and what's helped us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know you've been working with this mm -hmm. I mean, over the <clears throat> last few years. I mean, she just started a podcast too. We we'll have all the links on my notes here. And I want to start on by reading something that you wrote. And then I'll have a question, okay? Okay. You wrote, I had a bachelor's in psychology. I tutored children in a psychiatric ward and worked as a living counselor for emotionally disturbed boys. I've been an elementary school teacher for years and read all the parenting books. How could I have missed the signs in my own kids? I felt blindsided, naive. This is so powerful. You know, I had tears in my eyes when, uh -huh. when, I, when I read this. And, and I'm sure it adds layers and layers of guilt. I mean, every, it's common for parents to feel guilty when you hear something, like I just said, you know, I want to die, mom, from mm -hmm. your kid. But I want to hear from you about this experience. Did it add layers of, of guilt to you? The fact that you should know better, right? That's how you felt. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I think my biggest mess in all of this was the assumption, you know, once before you're a parent, you're the perfect parent, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, you always think, well, these people with children who are struggling or on drugs or whatever they're going through before you become a parent, you think, well, what did the parent do wrong? You know, you always mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, that's, I'm sad to say that that's how I felt. And before I became a parent, because then it's a different story, but my biggest mistake was making the assumption that if I was a really great parent, nothing would happen that would befall my children because I would prevent it from happening. And it's just not true. There are so many outside factors that come um, to take our kids down, I guess. And I feel like today our kids are walking in a world of quicksand and the world around them is more and more depressing. And there's a lot of things and the online world is horribly toxic. 
and one of my daughters really went there with all of that. And um, we were just all the re risk factors that could happen to create depression. And many of them came our way as a family. And I wasn't parenting with risk and resiliency factors in mind. I was just making the assumption like, okay, you know, I'm just going to be a great parent and my kids won't have these problems. So mm -hmm. I was wrong. Yeah, judgment, right? I'm sure that I, it's so common. We, as you said, before you were a parent, you think you know it all. And the first thing you, 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 you say is, what on earth, how could they not see? What kind of a parent mm -hmm. are they, right? And then it yeah. happens. Everyone is subject to that can be, right? Right. And ironically, I became the object of judgment later on in my journey as a parent with my children. And my children became objects of judgment as well. Um, so there's the irony there because then we got to be the recipients of the judgment. Um, one of my daughters, um, had a date rape and, um, you know, it's always people close to you that say these things, to be honest with you, but, um, I had a close person to me that said, you know, well, it's her fault for inviting the person over. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, even if something is initially consensual, if it turns violent, and non-consensual, then it's rape. I'm sorry to tell you. And so, and then another person said that my middle daughter was selfish for wanting to die. And so that I attribute to just, you know, the stigma of mental mm -hmm. illness and blaming people for the way that they feel and not understanding the level of despondency that people mm -hmm. get to when they are so depressed that nothing matters anymore. They just mm -hmm. don't understand that. Um, you know, it was, it was tough. Yeah. I'm, I'm so tough. sorry. I'm so sorry. It not a good, um, time. Let's say, um, I don't know. There was just a lot of judgment yeah. to our family and mm -hmm. a big factor in our family was verbal abuse and anger. And I got to the point personally where I myself could no longer function because I was just jello. I was paralyzed I was numb I was shaking all the time I was always oh getting God. yelled at all the time and the girls were witnessing this and you know I've actually had people say to me well no one got a black eye what's the big deal like so oh someone got angry you know goodness. and it was very minimizing the of I know and the huge thing I, I honestly think that every person, woman, you know, young woman, but also young men should learn about what is abuse. What is abuse? It takes so many forms. It's not just physical, sexual, it can be emotional, verbal, it can even be financial. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's isolation techniques, there's all kinds of ways to abuse people. And mm -hmm. I didn't see our family life as, a, as that. You know, I, I loved my ex, I loved him, I had compassion for what he went through with his own mental demons. Mm -hmm. But um, the way that the family was treated at times where there was lashing out and everything, I and if I had a crystal ball, I'm telling you right now, I would never have stayed 19 years in that marriage. And I, mm -hmm. if I had seen, if I had known how long the effects of abuse can last in a person's lifetime and seeing it come out in my you know, early 20 year old daughter, my oldest yeah. especially fell apart from that. It was very traumatic. And so she's the one that also got raped. So there was two men that were, you know, one was near and dear and the other one was not, but both had cross boundaries with her. And so it really de devastated her and she ended up with severe PTSD. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah. one of my current clients is a PTSD expert. I had no idea that PTSD is 10 times more prevalent in the civilian population as it is in the veteran population. I didn't know that children are more prone to PTSD than adults because they don't realize that bad things can happen. So they have this naivete about them. And so that's part of my podcast goals is, you know, I want to educate parents about the things that I didn't know or realize because mm -hmm. if I had, I, I could have made different choices or recognize signs along the way. Oh, my daughter's crying uncontrollably every day. 
oh my goodness, it's, it's actually, she's having nightmares. It's not a tantrum, right? It's not just a tantrum because no, that's what no. people say. It's a spoiled brat who is having a tantrum. So no, that's no. not natural for kids. No, right? but actually this was when she was 20, right? Yeah. So okay. this was down the road where mm -hmm. everything was starting to just hit home, like from the trauma from her childhood, but then also the recent rape, you know, just kind of combined. Oh my God. Just and then she had the severe edge. PTSD. Yeah. So it was, um, it's been a tough journey. So all three have gone through suicidal ideation. My middle one attempted twice in two months, came very close to death, like razor's edge of life and death and survived. Thank God. Uh, my oldest was writing goodbye letters last year. My youngest had sort of like, you know, when you hear about suicidal contagion, that's not just what people think like copycat. It's not that, it wasn't that in our family. The contagion aspect was being in a home where everything is volatile. Well, not always volatile, but when you're not sure what's going to happen because your sisters are so on the edge and, you know, openly claiming they want to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it made my youngest feel very unsafe um, because she was never sure like what might happen. So it, it created this anxiety in her. And so then she, as a result, because of her environment, she became suicidal as well. So that's how the yeah. contagion happened in our family. It wasn't like, oh, look at them. I'm going to do what they do. It wasn't that. It was the fact that there was a depressed environment and a volatile mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bring you bring so many important topics. One of them that, and also like you, that's why I do what I do too, is bringing knowledge, because we we just don't know, right? And that's mm -hmm. what makes us judge. Judgment is most of the times is lack of knowledge. You don't mm -hmm. know, so you judge because that's the quickest thing. And you, you talk about contagion. Contagion is, as you said, especially with teenager, young 20s, early 20s, is a, is a factor, is a very important factor when it comes to suicide ideation. But don't let it, can, can you tell me how it started? I mean, how, when did you, you were talking about abuse and that's something that I want to comment on as well. I co-facilitate uh, co two groups. One is anger management and the other one is uh, domestic violence. So one of the things that we teach, and it's one of the most important classes is what is abuse? Mm -hmm. Because it's what you talked about. We don't know what abuse is. We think that just screaming that, you know, we were just screaming. That's just express, expressing emotions yeah. and the impact that it has on your kids, especially over time in those marriages that last a long time with a lot of abuse, verbal abuse, mm -hmm. screaming, humiliation, contempt, all of, all of that is abuse. As you mentioned, financial mm -hmm. abuse, all of that is abuse. And it's one of the most important classes that we teach because they don't realize, and one of the things they have to do at the end of, of this treatment is to write a letter and say, which abuses did you commit? So they have to list mm -hmm. all the abuse. We have like a whole page of different types of abuse. So abuse is not just hitting someone, or as you said, getting a black eye. Abuse right. is not just sexual abuse so that's very important to know because i think that for my listeners if they're listening to you they can think about their own relationships and say wow maybe we have something to work on right now yeah but i want to go back to the beginning um when did you start noticing that there was some did they verbalize it immediately or was it after an attempt how did it happen so you know my so it started with my middle daughter in 2015. She started to become really depressed and, you know, her behavior was changing. She was moody. She had really bad um, anger outbursts and kind of irrational, you know, anger. <clears throat> so really, I have to say there was a time she was laying on the floor and she looked at me and she said, I want to die. And the deflector in me was like, what just did she just say? And I, I just had this denial of like, no, she doesn't want to, that she doesn't mean that she's being dramatic. So that was terrible that I, but it was sort of a self-defense mechanism. And you have mm -hmm. to understand also at that time, 
I myself was severely depressed because we had just had a divorce in our family. Uh, we were getting away from the abusiveness and it was uh, a change and we were all starting the healing journey. And so I was having a lot of difficulty um, with my own self-esteem and just trying to hold it together. And I just feel like the whole thing became, became this runaway train starting with that. And um, the first time I actually realized was when she literally um, tried to jump out a window one night and I had to stop her. And I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is the way it's real. Yeah. It's real. And it was a second floor, you know, and um, so we ended up at a crisis center and then the whole journey began. Mm -hmm. But then there was actually, you know, overdose attempts um, after that, not long after. But what, what amazed me, I could not believe we called a psychiatrist, you know, cause I knew there needed to be maybe some medication or intervention. Mm -hmm. And I was very anti-med. I have to say before this, yeah. I was so holistic and <clears throat> I never took meds and fought my own depression and myself. And, but I knew, you know, that, that she needed. It was too something. serious, right? Yeah. Too but much, we, yeah. we call and then this uh, psychiatrist office is like, okay, well, it'll be 90 days before you know you can be seen i was like you've got to be kidding me there is a 90 day wait when someone is suicidal like oh, really like what what yeah. are we supposed to do here and i told them point blank i said she will not survive in 90 days i i'm sure she will not survive and so thankfully they there was a cancellation list and so forth but we ended up going to our um local doctor and oh my gosh unbelievable he just looked at her point blank and he said, if you wanted to die, you'd be dead by now. Oh my like, goodness. You've got to be kidding me. And literally- They are she, not prepared. Doctors are not prepared to deal they don't with know suicide. how to deal. He was so out of his element. He's a GP and he just, the psychology is not his thing. And we were just trying to get meds, you know, to get mm -hmm. us through to the next point where we could get more help. But anyway, um, we walked out without meds because he scared me uh, about their use and- and then as we're walking out the door, he literally rolled his eyes like, hmm, as if to say, good luck with that one. I just couldn't believe I was so, it, it, that's just, you know, not everyone knows how to deal with this. And there's a shortage. There is such a shortage of care. People, there was, we had to go an hour away to another facility in the first attempt for her to be hospitalized because the one down the road had eight beds, eight beds. That was full. nothing. It's no, not, there was, no. there, it was full. It, we did, there was no room. So luckily our area has um, ratified a uh, tax that's going to build a new facility for mental health in this area. Because how can this be such an economically vibrant region, but yet we're not even making mental health a priority? It's crazy to me. We're missing mm -hmm. the boat. You can mm -hmm. have all the fancy shiny high rises and big box stores that you want, but what does it matter if we're all suffering and we can't access care? So that's... And, you, and you were suffering yourself, as you said, you just had a divorce. So yep. everything was upside down. And, and as you just, you just said that you were on time meds, right? And that's mm -hmm. very common too. Yep. I, I, I've been on time meds myself, um, but I, I, I took medication for depression as well, and it was so helpful. So I don't think it's the first option. Right. It shouldn't be the first option, but it does help, especially when there is suicide ideation involved. Right. If you're in crisis, you have to do something with professional help. Stabilize, you right? Yeah, you can't, you need to stabilize. You, that's the point where you can't do it on your own. So that's kind of what I've been talking about is like, we wait to the point in our society when people are there and then we help them, but we don't, you know, go 10 years before like these young males who are shooting people every day. Right. Okay. What happened to them when they were 10? Like, that's where we need to go yeah. is go back to where they were forming in those years. That's where we needed to support them mm -hmm. emotionally and help them with resilience and family structures. There's so many broken homes. It's incredible. And 30 million children a year are abused. So that's their background. And that's what they're bringing to the world is this brokenness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got to back up as a society and just make it a priority. And if we don't, we are missing it entirely.
nothing else Mm -hmm. will matter because we'll Mm -hmm. have dysfunctional people. Yeah. And we know from research that trauma, if you act upon it within the first six months, it's much easier for it not to become PTSD, right? Right. Well, and sometimes I have learned that PTSD can take a while to even manifest. And as it Mm -hmm. did in my daughter, it took years. I was really shocked. Um, But the other thing that I did learn was that you can't heal from trauma while you're still being traumatized. It's impossible because the damage keeps getting reinstated over and over. So you're trying to work on healing, but then you're just getting traumatized repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an abusive situation and you're trying to get counseling to get better, you know, to help yourself heal from it, but then you go home and then you're abused again, well, it's really, you don't get anywhere. It's like spinning your wheels. So the situation needs to change. And that's what happened. Finally, I, after 19 years and I got to the point where I just, I was like, okay, this is, I can't do this anymore. And I just regret that I didn't do it so much earlier. I I just really didn't realize how devastated my kids were by witnessing mine, but also experiencing their own. It was Mm -hmm. was just sad. And, you know, you just think, oh, someone is angry now and then it's okay. Like that's their problem. It isn't just their problem. You Mm -hmm. know, when you have black rage coming your way on a daily basis, it creates a lot of anxiety because Mm -hmm. even if the person is okay for the moment, you don't know if one is going to happen again. You wait mm-hmm. for the other shoe to drop because you're like, oh my goodness. Well, he seems okay right now, but you know, oh, and I better not do anything. And there becomes a self-effacement because you're afraid to poke the bear. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's that yeah. cycle of abuse. It's walking on eggshells. Then you mm-hmm. get the explosion and then yeah. you know they're sorry and they'll, it'll never happen again or whatever. And then it happens and it, it's escalate, usually escalates, right? That's yes. what, that's what we see in domestic violence as well. No, no, no. They, he or she, because uh, we have a few yep. women too, yes. but uh, no, they, they, they're not going to do it again. They're really sorry, but it's, yeah. it's about control. If you don't have self-control, if you don't get treatment for that and don't learn skills, Right. On how to cope with this kind of situation. Right. It's and only getting worse. And I think it's important what you mentioned, because for those who are listening, and if you're in a marriage, you have that, you know, that the family dynamics needs to change, change, because otherwise you are just creating a bigger problem. Right. Yep. And it's the other thing is repression. Okay. So, um, I saw that a lot with my daughters, like my youngest doesn't even remember some things that were really prominently very like, wow, this is a big moment kind of thing uh, that everybody remembers because it was traumatizing, but she like can't remember. And her defense mechanism is to repress the memory because it's too painful. Um, And then, you know, I just think repression is never going to help you because a repressed May, uh, pain a repressed memory or pr- repressed emotion it's still there you just pushed it down for the moment right so it's always going to resurface somehow that's there's no way unless you resolve it deal with it change your situation that kind of thing mm-hmm. even if your situation has changed you're going to have the residual effect of processing it um so repression to me is just very unhealthy and i saw a lot of it with my girls but it was their way of coping in the moment Um, it's very sad to see what happens, you know, over time and you Yeah. And repression is a mask, right? So, uh, you, you see that they seem to be fine. You look at them, no, they're fine. They're dealing. Okay. I don't, I don't see a problem, but next thing you know, you know, they're breaking up and they're yesterday I was watching a, a, a movie and there was a scene this guy learned uh he he lost his wife in a car ex it was a train accident and the daughter is trying to get psychologists crisis psychologists to come to the house and treat them because she knows he needs it and she needs it but she recognizes but he is the you know military man no i'm fine let's just deal with it don't cry and all of that and there, but there is a moment again, he represses, he represses, represses until there is a moment when he cracks and he starts because that's the emotion that men are allowed to show anger. 
So he breaks the whole place. But after that, he just, I mean, his body just gives in and said, no, I can't take this any, this repression anymore. Right. But the scene, the beautiful part of the scene was that <clears throat> he starts crying and shaking and he doesn't know what's going on. And he keeps asking his friend, what is going on? He's like in fetal position, cracking down. And he says, what is going on? I'm scared. Because he just was not able to recognize the emotion. Right. What is going on? And he's shaking and he keeps saying, what is going on? I'm scared. What is going on? I'm scared. Because he repressed it, right? Yeah. So I want to talk about that and how that is changing because, you know, it's pretty recent what happened to you. So I'm sure that it's evolving. You're still learning to deal with it mm -hmm. as a family and <clears throat> the sisters among themselves. So how do you bring, how did it affect the communication? And are you, are you able to talk about these things now? Or is it, of course, there are different people, different kids. I'm sure it's different with each one. And even their communication as siblings and as sisters has changed. So, so how is that working right now? Do you find that they're repressing less and you're able to, you know, to have the tough conversations? Well, since everything has been so... It festered, but then it blew. I mean, I'm just saying like everything, you know, was so under the surface and it just seemed like, wow, everything just went down, you know, and each one of them became suicidal in a very short amount of time. And so it's kind of forced us to address everything head on because there is no more hiding from what's actually going on. And as a re result, they be have become much more honest about everything, like even Sometimes, you know, even uh, with each other or with, with the way they relate to me, they'll be like, mom, I don't like this, that, you know, how you're, you know, I feel like you're dismissing my feelings when you say this or whatever, you know, a lot of this too is normal teenage angst and that kind of thing. But it honestly, I feel like this whole experience, like we walked through fire together and I feel like it really just bonded us as a family and they've come each to their own terms with their dad and they've each made their peace with him. And my youngest didn't go with him for a while and just said, I need a break. And this is the way you're acting. And this is how I need you to change. And he responded. And it was just really beautiful. Like, you know, real communication and honesty made actual change in patterns of behavior. And uh, these girls are very close to each other. It's so rare that they fight or anything. It's really amazing people remark on it because three girls you know usually there's drama and, <laughs> but um they really support each other and they look out for each other they look out for me I look out for them I don't know there's a really nice dynamic that goes on I have to say it really pulled us together as a family that's how I feel not well, not I really I can relate Dawn I can relate I have two sisters we yeah I know <laughs> it's, it's I don't know it's the female power kind of thing too but not to, I mean, men are wonderful and there's many wonderful men out there. I just feel like there's a, all three of them have felt this toxic masculinity in our society mm -hmm. and have been the object of, you know, unwanted attention or, uh, you know, men that just don't know how to feel or express their emotions. And I, I just feel like that's really creates a lot of issues in marriages and relationships and not to say it's all men's fault or whatever, but, you know, I think there's just a lot of work to be done in our society. Um, yeah. Even yeah. the fact that rape still happens, I'm thinking like, really? Like why these young men don't know better? Like has nobody educated anybody mm -hmm. about, you know, respect and boundaries. And But I think the online world is really affecting men's psyches and they're getting access to pornography 24 seven and, uh, there's a lot of toxic encouragement of suicidality and mm -hmm. how to kill yourself websites and go for it, Instagram groups and mm -hmm. yeah. really sad to see what's affecting our kids, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they change the way they, they relate to social media? Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm often curious about this because I have a very negative, I, I know that negative bias against Mm -hmm. uh, social media. I mean, I look at the research and, you know, I have a lot of teenage and early 20 clients too. And I, I see what it does to them. Yep. 
But okay. it's so hard because they live on their phones, right? And oh. again, it's one of the areas that you go, where are the parents, right? Again, where, where are the parents? Don't they establish limits for this? Yes. But how can you, right? You're working all day and, and they have their phones 24-7. Right. It's, I mean, there has to be some boundaries there because, okay, here's the thing. So I thought, you know, in when I was reacting to everything that went on, when I discovered all the crazy things that were happening online that I had no, it's like having strangers in the room next to you, like in your home, you, you could invite someone off the street. And that's really what you've done is you've invited people into mm -hmm. your home that you don't even know. And you don't even know that they're interacting with your children and or how or what they're doing. And there's no checks and balances. It's an unsupervised playground for bullies. It's uh, a place where they learn that image is everything. It's a place where toxic behaviors are encouraged. You know, my friend had a daughter that was in this anorexia group, like who can be thinner, you know, that kind of thing. And peers are so important to them. And there's, you know, in real life as a teacher on the playground, if kids were bullying, I could say, Hey kids, this yeah. is actually really mean. And no, 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 we're not going to do that. Right. And they stop because you shape the behavior online. Who's doing that? Nobody. There's nothing short of anything being red flagged or, but even then, I mean, there was an Instagram man who had scantily clad woman as his all different women all on his page, um, young, you know, all of them all different. So, you know, that that's what he's doing all day, soliciting photos from people, but that yeah. doesn't get taken down, even though every, I'm sure Instagram kind of knows what he's doing. So, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I'm Yeah. They're ha they're but you're, you're right. You're right. It's very uh, unregulated and unregulated. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. And so, and then there's a lot of young kids that the way they interact with real people becomes like this running diatribe, like what they hear online. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is not how we relate to people. We don't have to show off and do a show. You just have to talk mm -hmm. and ask questions yeah. and yeah. it's affecting how people are relating to each other and self-esteem and uh, yeah. can you can you tell me because uh, you you have listened to my podcast and you know I am always you know, my main objective is to help right mm -hmm. so give them skills so can you share with us you talked about communication family family dynamics had to change so that you had a healthier uh, relationship with your kids and 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 them with you mm -hmm. what else did had to change i mean what helped you and what is helping you now with your kids what helps the most what can you tell parents so i have to say that uh each one of them so they actually um so i wrote this parent support book and my girls each wrote a chapter um mm -hmm. in there and on what did help them and for each one it's a different thing and uh my oldest is a avid musician she actually got a tuition scholarship for music and um she plays many instruments and now she's playing in a band and for her music has always been the place to go even listening to music creating music writing music so that has become sort of the place where she can express herself and she re sees herself reflected in other people's creations as well that she feels that can relate to how she's feeling because music is very emotional. Um, even if it's angry or emotive or sad or sentimental or ruminating, there's many emotions that come through music. And for her, that's been very healing. And she also started to find this incredible passion in the last year for crocheting Wow. Oh my gosh. Like give mental. her my phone. I love crocheting. I'm making a bag right now. <laughs> oh, so she I actually taught one of my clients and she's now totally hooked on it. It's amazing. <laughs> and for her, her mind was always like, Oh, like what is going to happen? Like this gloom and doom, like I'm going to freak out and everything, you know, it, like it, always sense of impending doom and, for, you know, yes. just having these frenetic moments of panic. And so with crochet, she's able to just like focus on the moment, yes. yeah. right? Because anxiety is bred by fear of the future and depression uh -huh. is bred by ruminating on the past. So the if past, you stay yeah. solidly in the present, right? So she has these mandala blankets, these beautiful, Ooh. she made an entire dress and 
um, it's really just amazing blankets. Um, she's doing a little frog yeah. mascot for her uh-huh. band. And <laughs> it's just fun. So the, hers is the arts basically. And then my middle daughter is running. She runs exercise. Run- yeah. Yes. And it helped the physiological help of running, you know, you get the runners high and you feel better physically, which helps mm-hmm. you psychologically as well. Um, you know, cause certainly you're going to feel better running than you are going to be in front of a TV eating Cheetos, right? It, mm-hmm. Psychologically, you just are feeling better. So she's found a lot of solace in that. And then my youngest loves to be with her friends and write and um, so connection and friendships. Helps. Yeah, that's been really healing for her and pe- feeling like people understand her is really important. Mm-hmm. So that's what she's really latched on to is those dear, dear friends that are not judging at all mm-hmm. and want their own journeys and they share so closely and they'll take bike rides and go howl mm-hmm. at the moon, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. Like just yeah. having adventure, merry adventures yeah. and you know, I think a lot of that was lost last year with the isolation and mm-hmm. that really has devastated our children having the connection with other kids and it's so important to them. You know, we're not everything mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. Especially as they get older. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the example of your daughters and it's great. I can't wait to read your book. I know you're you're almost there, right? You're supposed- yes. Well it's it's yeah. uh it's is it being and proofread and laid out and all that. So yeah. Okay, it's probably- cool. In uh, it's, end of August yeah. of 2020. End of August, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'll make sure to have on my notes when you release yeah. it. Let me know. But I love that you had first of all had them put it on a piece of paper because mm-hmm. that's one of the most helpful things when you actually write down about your experience. That's yeah. healing in itself. And the example you give one was art, the other one exercise, and the third one connection. So friends. Yes. And that brings up, I think, a very important point. So don't assume you know what's best for your kids because that's something that parents do, right? You mentioned in the yep. beginning. I just thought that if I were in whatever in your mind it, me, being the best parent mm-hmm. is it's going to be different for each child because yep. they have different needs they're different people so instead of assuming sit down with them and ask because here's one thing that we all know most of the times we know what helps us we've all been through difficult times we just we've been through COVID now and I'm sure that at the end, I mean, uh, we're not at the end of COVID yet, but it's much better now. We have hope, right? But yeah. I, I'm sure that you know much more now what helps you than you did in the first months. Same thing with your kids and your friends. If you have friends who are struggling with suicidal ideation, sit down with them and ask, I mean, what helps you? So let's go towards that. Don't assume you know, oh, let's go do exercise because it's good mm-hmm. for you. Maybe they yeah. hate that exercise. Some yeah. people do. Some people can't do. The other one, no, we're going to crochet. Are you kidding me? Crochet? But, you know, crochet, actually, they did a study on crochet in, in uh, knitting because it's very uh, similar. And you mm-hmm. said something that's so important. Yeah, anxiety is about the future. Depression is about the past. And yeah. that's the value of mindfulness. Mindfulness is not just a thing that everybody talks about now being in the present is one of the most uh, one of the hardest challenges that we have in modern society now because of these screens right we are never present because we're always watching something that happened in the past or we're reading something that might happen in the future it's never about the present right so and that's one of the important uh why uh, I talk to my clients about this, my patients all the time, have some time off screen because we need to relearn how to come back to the present. And what you said just exemplifies that perfectly. And just think about it. How many times do you see a family and there's five people in a room and everyone's on their phone? What about putting it down and just talking to each other? It's, Mm -hmm. It's really, we're losing a lot of that connection when we have the time to be together or somewhere else with someone else. So it's like, okay, why can't we be present and be with who we are? You know, if someone texts you, that doesn't mean you have to stop the conversation 
that you're having at the moment to quickly text back. They're not with you. The person in front of you is with you. So give them your time, make them mm-hmm. the valuable yeah. person. And I have to say, uh, you know, it's a busy world and it's very goal driven in this world. And I, I have, you know, to-do lists like eight miles long and all that. And I have like, you know, literally like 15 different lists for different things. And so, uh, you know, I had to stop and just say, and focus instead of being so like, oh, I have this to do and that to do. It's like, wait, these kids are here. They need you. And they need you to sit down and really, really listen. And even if you don't like what you're hearing, you still need to hear it because it's sometimes painful. Like, oh my gosh, that didn't really happen, did it? Or, oh no, you don't really feel that way because no, that's not, you know, how it should be. Or, you know, we superimpose our own expectations and disappointments. Uh, Sometimes we are disappointed and we don't want to believe that, that our child is doing that or feeling that way, or, you know what I mean? It's, Mm -hmm. we have sort of Mm -hmm. these parental expectations that we superimpose on them. And part of that does shape who they are as a person, but then there comes a point where they're going to do what they're going to do independently of you. And, uh, that was really tough Mm -hmm. to see, but you know, there's a lot, you, you, you had to unlearn a lot of things, right? Yeah. What you said, you, it, being a parent is about learning, unlearning, adapting, right? Yep. Listening. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's, I really still to this day say to myself, wow, this is just the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> like, oh I, I can't believe I, can, I just can't imagine it, it, it honestly. Okay. So, you know, the first I'm shocked, I'm blindsided at first, you know, this is six years ago, but even lately there's still things that crop up or moments of like oh you know are they really okay and and I find myself to the point of being just bone weary bone weary and um, I go in and out of depression myself because of the load to carry as a parent yes you know, like one suicidal person but three is it's just but fortunately oh you know like my middle daughter who had the two attempts she's so she's thriving and she always says Aww. mom you always say you're so proud of me for overcoming my depression. I'm, I still get depressed. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I said, and that's, that's okay. That's okay. We I, all get depressed sometimes. I know it's, it's not, not a problem. Fact like that. I'm not saying like, Oh, you beat depression. Good for you. That's not really what I'm saying. I'm saying like, I'm proud of you because you, you did the hard, 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 hard work to dig in, put one foot in front of the other when you still really didn't feel like it. You still tried to, it to do it, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, when someone is deeply depressed, sometimes you're just like pushing them along because they really don't have the desire. You know, mm-hmm. when you're that down, you really yeah. become yeah. very hopeless and helpless. Yeah. It's immobilizing depression. It, oh, yeah. It's crippling. I've been depressed myself to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. Like my legs wouldn't even move. So I understand it. I do. I understand what it's like to be there. Um, mm-hmm. Not everyone who gets that low gets suicidal, fortunately because there'd be a lot more yeah yeah yeah. than there are now but anyway it's uh it's a journey and Mm -hmm. i feel kind of in some some days forge of steel other days still weepy yeah (laughs) well yeah of course and 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 it's natural dawn it's natural i know the day we learn that emotions are natural and they're actually helpful because they give you a sense of who you are yeah. what you're going through in life and it's not about beating it's not about beating depression it's not about uh suppressing your emotions because it's not okay to cry right uh, we have a phobia of people crying i don't know where oh, yeah. that comes from i mean oh he cried it's like the end of the world because someone <laughs> cried so what cry oh, with them God. hold their hands oh. Yeah, they're, well, they're they're expressing their emotions. Let people express it. There's nothing wrong with crying. Yesterday, yeah. I was actually talking to someone, and uh, they were telling me about uh, a friend who came over. His wife died of of COVID recently, a month ago, 
and and she was telling me i mean how she was trying to distract him and I, and i said you know the for me the logical because i know when yeah. i i deal with grief all the time and right. and i love working with grief and i know many times what they want is to talk about how they're feeling to talk about the loved one they lost and people right. get so scared by that right, right. and this person was because i i asked so, so what happened and what happened? Was it quick? Was it unexpected? Were they sick before? And and she said, I don't know, because I didn't want to talk about it. I kept talking about something else to distract him because he right. was crying. Uh-huh. And I'm going, oh, my God, yeah, no, he was an, crying because a, he needed to cry. It's a missed opportunity for <sighs> someone who's already emoting to like just kind of share like, OK, let, let me know how you're feeling and just yeah. be fucking listening. You don't even have to. I think really what it is boils down to. Uh, honestly, Paula, is that people feel the need to fix it. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they have to come up with the right thing to say. And people who are grieving that deeply, they don't want that at the moment. They just need Mm -hmm. to process their grief and they just need to to cry. So let them cry, right? Cry with them. Well, if that's going to be the moment of your relationship, you'll never forget because you shared something very deep. And I feel too, there's a lot of pain avoidance, you know, take this pill, you'll never feel a thing, you know, giving, I mean, you know, many of us have given birth with drugs because we don't want to feel that amount of pain, you know, and it's, it's just a pain avoidance kind of society, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Uh, we, we have the mechanisms to be able to numb pain. So we do it. So Mm -hmm. I think when we numb physical pain, it's like, well, how can I numb my emotional pain? But is there really a way to do it except for to really dig in and let it, let it process, let it grieve, Mm -hmm. let it do its work because emotions have a purpose. You're sad for a reason. And so the sadness is a reflection of like, okay, something is happening. That is needs to change. Right. Right. So that's what emotions do. They, they acknowledge it. Show you what needs to change or what's affecting you, who you are, what your values are. That's what emotions are there for. They have a function. And that's why I was talking about repression is people don't want to feel that pain. So they push it away any way they can, you know, with drugs, sometimes alcohol, you know, whatever there uh, could be workaholism. There's many ways Mm -hmm. to avoid, you know, but it it will come back because it's, it's asking you to be addressed, you know, it's that subconscious part of your brain saying, Hey, this is still here. You can't (laughs) get away from it. No, no, (laughs) you you can't. So, um, but I did want to uh, mention one of my, my youngest, um, it was really beautiful. She wrote about trauma in her piece in the book. And Mm -hmm. she talked about the fact that I've always told them, I wish I had loved sooner and I'm sorry, you know, because I feel the guilt of like my decision as a, an adult affected their lives as children. And I had the power to change that, but you know, there's so many reasons it didn't happen. And, um, you know, but she said, I wouldn't change my life. She said, trauma has shaped who I am. Uh, It's made me, you know, um, the highs are higher. Like when I look at the Mm -hmm. sky and the clouds and the beauty of this world. Yeah. Yeah. She said, it's made me appreciate the good in this world so much because I've experienced bad. And so I've seen that side. And so the other side that is good is much more yeah. beautiful and so she's colorful. reframing her trauma that's beautiful yeah it's really and doing it naturally as a 16 year old you know so I told her I said you should be a counselor someday I said you <laughs> just have so much inner wisdom about you know how to look at things and she's giving people advice who are older oh. than her it's just really cute but she's really wonderful they're all I'm so proud of my daughters and their mm grace in overcoming a lot of this and you know not to say nobody ever struggles it, that's not the point of it it's just that the resilience that they, they've shown and the willingness to try and learn and to communicate has been just really wonderful and um, well, I'm glad I'm glad to know that they're healing that it affected affected positively from what you say the dynamics of the family yeah. and the relationship between you and even your ex-husband as yep. you mentioned you yep. kind of kind of you're changing him too so that's important yep. because they, he will always be a part of your your daughter's life and your yeah. life in a way right right and that's do you why. have do you have anything else to tell parents that you think they should be aware of something that you learned or that you should 
you know, if you that you if you had known that then what I wish I had known I actually wrote a list of uh, that not for this uh, purpose but at one point I wrote I wish I wish this I wish this had happened you know I had so many regrets um I guess speaking to that effect you know we are really hard on ourselves as parents most people who are you know most people are very caring and really want to do the best they can and I think as a parent, you have to give yourself grace and just, you have to do the best you can, but you have to give yourself grace because it's not your fault. Like it's not, you can't just blame yourself. You know what I mean? Unless you have things to work on or issues or dynamics or ways that you need to, that's great and fine and everything. But, um, you know, it's really tough to be going through this when I, I'm in some online Facebook groups and I see a lot of repeating themes of hopelessness. And, you know, I, for me, what brought me through everything, to be honest with you, was staunch optimism and uh, an unwillingness to let this take us down. Like I just refused. <laughs> so for example, we were in a crisis center one time and the, this lady remarked to me, she said, okay, she goes, most parents come in here, they're angry, they're with their child for trying to, you know, die, and they're upset and rattled, and they just really, you know, which is so normal, right? But I kind of countered that. And I was like, okay, we can do this, you can get better, you know, so I was just being staunchly positive, and, and they said that that was not common. So I feel like that was a really powerful thread throughout this ordeal that I've try mm -hmm. to keep is the hope and the optimism and just the staunch positivity like yeah. okay yeah. we're gonna do this we're gonna do the best we can we're gonna take one thing at a time we're going to address each thing as it arises I don't live with anxiety today it's really strange because there are moments where I still wonder if they're going to be okay you know of course but I can't do that because I, I would not survive with that anxiety no it no, would you wouldn't eat yeah. me alive and so i just each day is a gift and each day is a joy and we yeah. have many moments of joy and um so we just continue on and um keep on with the healing and yes i'm just trying mm -hmm. to be there for them as needed and uh -huh. you know, two of them are out of the house now so yeah and as as the person who was talking to you at, in the hospital said it's natural to feel angry but that's not the best moment to express right. that anger you know, be there, be supportive, and find other ways to to deal with the anger because they're showing you, they're giving you a precious sign mm -hmm. that you should pay attention to. There's something needs to be changed. They are in pain. You have to always pain, remember that. Yeah. They're not trying to hurt you. They're just lashing out and you're the safe haven and you'll be mm -hmm. the one that gets the brunt of most of it if they love you. you yeah, know? Because, because they know you love them and you you will forgive and you will. Yeah, it's right. unconditional love. Like it's easy to say I have unconditional love when, you know, your child is like sailing along, but when you've been punched in the face or whatever, you know, might happen in a yeah. volatile situation. It's a trial. Yeah. A lot of things can be really out of control, you know, or and then, you know, that's when your unconditional love is really yeah. unconditional because yeah. it's like, I love this child. I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to do whatever it takes to help them heal and be whole again. That's mm -hmm. what it's all about as a parent. You are there for them. So it's very uh, sacrificing, but we do it because yeah. we love them. So, yeah. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you for being here with us. Tell us you. your website and the name of your podcast that you just started. I listened to one of the episodes. Oh, okay. Uh, it's hopefuldawn.com. And there you'll find the podcast page and you can access it all on there on all different um, avenues. And that's called Empowered Parenting for Emotional Wellness. And what's really neat about that, it's uh, mental health experts, but then each topic has an, uh, an accompanying Pinterest board so that there's educational resources surrounding the podcast cool. on that topic. So um, I want it to be an educational venture. I used to be a teacher yeah. and I'm all about this being yeah. very, it's your, it's natural for you. <laughs> yes. I love it. And then the other, uh, the book is, um, hopeless night, hopeful dawn. And it's just an in analogy, August, right? 
Yeah, but if you home. go to the website, you you'll see, you know, it's yep, you'll see, and you can get on a waiting list to, you know, just email me and uh, if it's not out yet. And um, so the subtitle of that is staying positive and proactive when your child is suicidal. So that book is specifically for parents who are going through supporting a suicidal yeah. child and how to stay yeah. strong and positive. And so it's part memoir, part advice, encouragement, empowered mm -hmm. parenting affirmations self-reflection yeah. journaling yes. excellent resources okay. yeah thank so, you thank you dawn yes i'm just you. finishing now my first online course on how to help because that's the i think that's the most important thing that everybody asks me i get so many emails asking how can i help my son or my daughter how, yeah. how can i help my loved ones when they're contemplating suicide so i just finished my first online course and it will be released in about a month how to awesome. help suicidal people so it's very straightforward yeah and i'm really happy about that because i've Wonderful. been putting this together in 13 years of interviews and books and everything so yeah so helpful. you've learned a lot from other people oh yes yeah and yeah. it's great so you're a fountain of knowledge now for other people and a beacon of hope yeah that's the most important thing i bring hope yeah thank you dawn have a good day and say you know send my love to your daughters i'm so thank glad so they're much. doing well thank i just you. i actually just saved the picture of you with your daughters that you have on your website because oh. when i when i do the video i'm going to show the picture of you if that's yeah. okay yes thank you so much yeah. thank you have a good day okay thank you so much for your time i appreciate it take care